Please rise for the opening prayer and the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> Dear gracious God, we pray that you will guide and bless our meeting this morning. Lord, may your face shine upon us with your grace and mercy. We pray that we will feel your presence without, with us throughout the day, because you are with us wherever we go. We ask this meeting to focus upon your plans you have for us. Let our actions be positive and valuable to our aim, which is to build up each individual and help each other. We humbly ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We'll convene the Commissioner's public meeting at this time and ask for approval of the minutes for the previous meeting. I move to approve. I second. All in favor say aye. 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 So carried. Public comment on agenda items only. Hearing none, move on. 2.0, Nikki Gottschall, uh, the accounts payable cash requirements report. Morning, Nikki. Good morning, commissioners. Uh, this week, the cash requirement report is $847,235.22. Did you have any questions? Uh, you answered mine earlier, so thank you. Mm -hmm. No, I'm good. Okay, hearing none, I have a motion to accept the cash requirement summaries. I move to approve. I second. All in favor say aye. 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 So carried. Thank you. Thank you. 3.0 with Roxanne Greco, uh, personnel actions. Good morning, Roxanne. Good morning, commissioners. In the Register and Recorder's Office, Leslie Carnavale, full-time replace 
or reclassification clerk three, pay grade four, fifteen dollars and twenty six cents hour, uh, effective January twenty fourth, twenty twenty one. Also in the Register and Recorder's Office, Elliot C. Crossley as a full-time reclassification clerk three, pay grade four, $14.09 hourly, effective January 24th, 2021. In the courts, MDJ Solomon, Caitlin Stover is a full-time replacement clerk three, pay grade four, $14.09 hourly, effective February 8th, 2021. In the prison, Christine M. Now, full-time replacement clerk three, pay grade four, $14.09 an hour, effective February 8th, 2021. At the prison, Caitlin M. Townsend, full-time replacement, correctional officer relief, male slash female, pay grade CO1, $17.46 an hour, effective February 2nd, 2021 and finally at the prison Sean A. Bogart full-time replacement correctional officer relief pay grade CO1 $17.46 an hour effective February 14th 2021 okay so these are replacement positions or reclassification positions uh, a couple clerks that were not on the same level as the other clerks that is correct the county making that more is unified right okay any other questions or comments? I have a motion to accept. So moved. I'll second. All in favor say aye. 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 So carried. Thank aye. you. Aye. Thank you. 4.1 Maya Tune. Vote on purchase of the 2021 Ford F-150. Maya, you there? Good morning, commissioners. Yep. Yeah. Morning, Maya. Good morning. Good morning. Um, the item here is to vote on the purchase of a 2021 Ford F-150 crew cab. That's for the domestic relations office, and it's from um, Whitmore Auto Group. It's in the amount of $46,500. Um, they are CoStar's contract, but also I'd like to note that the funding for this purchase is actually being done from special revenue funds through the domestic relations office. They're tied up for DE monies, so there are no outside um, general fund money is being used for this purchase. Okay, good. Any comments? And part, of the reason, part of the reason they get those funds, I think, is because they do a very good job of uh, fulfilling the federal requirements to collect and the state requirements. That's correct. So, yep, and then, you know, just funding <clears throat> specifically to be used towards these type of purchases. Okay. I'll move to approve the purchase. A second. All in favor say aye. 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 So carried. 4.2 is my attune. Voting on awarding um, the proposal for the purchase of the delivery of 144 golf carts. Um, I know we're still in the holding period um, on getting a final number on that. I haven't heard back from Chris Strand. But um, tentatively, um, we're still waiting to get, I think, the trade-in value, um, but we believe it's going to be fine. But ultimately, the proposal came in just for the purchase of the and delivery of the 144 golf carts with club car in the amount of $3,500 per cart. And the proposal is about $50,000 less, I believe? Mm-hmm. Okay, that's good news. When we when we put it out to competitive bid, right, it yes. came in fifty thousand less, which is good. Which always is a good reminder for us to use that competitive seal uh, seal bidding. So I think that we we need to discuss where it's coming from, right, or how it's being. That's five hundred and four thousand, Maya. The one forty four. Now it it will it will not be more than that. Is that the is that the? That's what I understood because um, the proposal they provided for the five hundred four thousand and thirty six cents that was including the trade in value and all the other ancillary type things that they were looking to to get as a result of the purchase. Okay. I think the biggest hold up was that they actually had to do an on site visit for um, the current carts that they have. And they were supposed to do that Friday, and I think um, for some reason, unfortunately beyond their control, they had to cancel that. So 
So in order to truly see, to make sure that, to represent the trade-in value that they provided, they wanted to do an on-site visit of the carts. Okay. And what we'll be doing is an eight-year loan uh, with Indigo Golf, which is former Billy Casper Golf, and uh, they will be making a one-time payment uh, to us uh, per year for those eight years. Uh, they'll be making their payment in October um, to the county um, to uh, satisfy the loan. And it'll be a 2% interest. So I think it's important for the public to understand that, we, first of all, the money for this is coming from the revenue of the golf course. And uh, my colleagues can give, I think, if I saw it correctly, there's over $200,000 that they have in, in cash on hand. Um, the golf course has been doing better and it's a it's a uh, improvement for our community to be able to have a public golf course. But we've been paying to rent cars. And correct me if I'm wrong, Commissioner Ms. Aaron Metzger, because I, I couldn't make it to the meeting the other day at the course. But um, we've been paying to lease cars, and it's getting to the point where it's actually more <clears throat> economically advantageous for us to do this uh, this purchase because we'll have them for, for a long time and uh, we hope to be able to make money on them through the, uh, well we do make money on them through uh, people paying for the use of the cards when they use the course uh, and also some other ideas with maybe advertising and so forth. Uh, but I think after we examined all the options we thought this was the most prudent and the good news is also we had, we had uh, we had it vetted by the REC authority, one of whom was the people as a banker, and so we, we kind of have worked out the best way to finance this in the least cost. Yes, they did a cost analysis on it. This was the best option to go. Uh, the previous cards were anywhere from 18 to 20 years old. Uh, they were breaking down, uh, which uh, resulted in more maintenance cost on them. Um, our maintenance department spending more time on them over there. And, um, there was uh, the straps are breaking and uh, golfers clubs are falling off and breaking. We had to replace golfers clubs uh, throughout last year, uh, which leaves a bad taste in, in a customer's mouth, having their they had their clubs damaged as they're playing. And um, this was the best the best avenue to go. Uh, we feel that they're in a financial position now. Uh, due to them having a couple strong years, especially this past year, with, even with COVID, they had a very good year, that they're in a uh, situation now where they, they're able to uh, uh, be able to pay back the uh, the loan over an eight-year period. Yeah, for um, <clears throat> for me to see the, the, the cash that they had uh, in the bank, I think it was about two hundred and fifty, two hundred sixty thousand dollars. Now that wasn't what they made last year. It was a little over a hundred thousand in the black. But for decades, this golf course has lost money and uh, was a burden on on the taxpayers. Um, and I know we had an extraordinary year last year with the drought and and the pandemic. But it, it brought a lot of people together and a lot of families went out there to play and uh, a lot of athletes that uh, didn't look as, at golf as a, uh, a challenge uh, suddenly realized, wow, this is challenging. And it's something that I, I believe that the golf industry is going to experience uh, rewards off of this. Um, I'm very, very happy to see finally the numbers turn around. and. Um, Giving them a loan at two percent uh, makes sense to us, especially now. I mean, we're making anywhere from a half to one percent on our money, and uh, that that doubles uh, what we'd be making somewhere else. Uh, for the golfers out there, um, the golf carts uh, have some accessories on uh, on them, and uh, will be very convenient. Uh, Billy Casper, well, it's called well, it's not Indigo, Indigo now. Indigo, yeah. Uh, they had their own app, and and it's of the holes when you're playing when you're playing golf. It will show you on the app where you're at, how many yards to the flag, how many yards to the 
sand trap and um, it's a really nice app uh, for our golf course and there's actually ports that you can plug your phone into on these golf carts because inevitably your phone runs out of juice using you know, these apps and uh, what, a, what a bonus that's going to be for, for the golfers. Um, so I'm, I'm pretty excited. They were needed. Uh, the average life, uh, expected life is between eight and 10 years and we have 18 on ours. But there's a lot of cost and maintenance and personnel to, to fix those golf carts. And uh, we won't have that cost coming up. Uh, it's just gonna be in the maintenance, uh, month, limited maintenance on these carts. So uh, I'm more than happy that uh, we're going to replace that fleet. Yeah. And it was, it was and I think I think we're agreed that this is not coming at gen out of a general fund alone. It'll either come out of Act 13 or some other uh, other funds that we have, RMS fund. But because I I think that the begs the question for the public is you know you shouldn't have half a million dollars sitting around that you can just loan in the general fund. Right, it's there for one other pur purpose or another. That's, I think this that's correct. Go ahead. I'll, that's yeah. correct. It won't so, come out of the taxpayers' fund. Not going to come out of taxpayers. And by the way, the money that Commissioner Mathere mentioned, that's the taxpayers' money. And, and our goal, our continued goal, is to have this course be able to pay back some of the funds that uh, it has been relying on, over the, as Commissioner Mathere said, over the past eight years. I, I think it's, I want to just emphasize this for the public. People may say, you know, geez, the commissioners are doing this in the midst of this pandemic and their businesses are in crisis and people are losing their jobs, etc. We can't simply stand still with various assets that the county owns. In other words, you, you can't have a golf course without having carts that people are in. And so we have to be able to keep moving ahead at the same time being very sensitive to the situation that many in our community are in with the goal of hopefully creating a quality of life that attracts people to the county. You may not golf as you listen or read this in the paper, but there are people who do golf and who will come to live in Lycoming County because there's a public golf course. And in a situation where our population is decreasing, we need to do everything we can to try to attract people to come here for the quality of life. So hopefully this will continue to make that course something that attracts people, just like the Community Arts Center attracts people and, you know, other things, whether they're ballparks, et cetera. So. And one thing I, I hear often is there's nothing to do in Lycoming County, which is not true. And this is an asset that we can utilize in Lycoming County it's important how we utilize it for our golfers, but also for our nonprofits. Uh, our nonprofits have tournaments over there every year that that raise three to four hundred thousand dollars. And with COVID and with businesses uh, shutting down and and they're not um, at liberty to give um, sponsorships and um, uh, monies away to these nonprofits because they're just not able to at this time. This is another way that for those nonprofits to be able to raise money uh, so they can exist because we have a lot of good nonprofits in Lycoming County that need to need to operate, need to exist. And this is a, another way they can do so through this asset. And it would be remiss of us not to, to mention that um, there's some more board members that we placed on the Rec Authority Board. And uh, they come from diverse backgrounds, from retired teachers who have played at that golf course, or a teacher who've played at that golf course ever since he was probably in elementary school. Uh, it brings a lot of knowledge about the golf course and the history, institutional knowledge, the history of the course. Uh, we have two businessmen, we have a banker and bookkeepers, and and we're well positioned uh, for them to, to keep an eye on everything and how it's going. Um, so uh, I want to thank them for volunteering and stepping up uh, to help the commissioners out. And uh, 
I know that they're going to be calling the master gardeners to go up there and beautify the golf course around the, the clubhouse so that it can be used by more people than just golfers. And we're looking forward to the transformation of this golf course uh, uh, for a multi-use in, in the future. Yeah, that, that's a good point. In fact, they, they're looking at, uh, we've talked about that a lot, about trying to make it a place that families can go even if they don't go. And they're working on some things with the, uh, the soccer-like golf. I forget what they call it. The, you know, in other words, these are, these are uh, uh, events that people can participate in who don't golf also. So yeah, for, it becomes, for, you know, a further recreation area. Okay. okay. Can I have a motion to accept the proposal for the purchase and delivery of the golf carts? I move, I move to approve. I'll second. All in favor say aye. 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 So carried. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you. 4.3 with Brooke Wright. Vote on agreement with the Department of Community and Economics Development. Yeah. Brooke, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Okay. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. I'm asking morning. you. I'm doing good. Thank you. I'm asking you to vote on the agreement with the Department of Community and Economic Development to forego receipts of payments for real estate transfers that are sent to DCED, which, in a sense, is the State Tax Equalization Board is why we send these real estate transfers to them. They pay us 20 cents a ballot sale, and they are asking us for the next 10 years, beginning on January 1st, 2021, and ending on December 31st, 2030, that DCED shall withhold payments due to the counties under the Act and use each payment for the sole purpose of developing and maintaining a new and standardized statewide database. This database allows the State Tax Equalization Board to come in to audit us, run reports for all the government agencies that are requested. All 67 counties are in agreement with this agreement to forego payment for the next 10 years. We only average about $600 a year for ballot sales, so it's a minimum loss, I think. Do you have any questions? Well, hopefully this will help us bring the uh, process into sort of a modern age, which, which eventually should help you be more efficient in your office, right? Well, they will allow us to use the databases to run reports, et cetera, to re so that will help us, yes. Yeah. Is this database going to keep uh, values updated? I'm sorry, Tony, I couldn't hear you. Will this uh, data help um, uh, bring values updated uh, annually as to the sales uh, Prices. They do that now. Yeah, yes. But they I do understand. it all on paper now. So bringing it into the computer will make it more faster and efficient right. for the auditors. Yes. So one one of the issues, um, and and Steb um, was an agency that that we relied heavily upon, uh, especially when we were determining um, what was that called. Common level ratio. Common level ratio. Thank you. Um, and you know you can read many articles that uh, believe that that is a good indicator of when a re reassessment is needed. And then likewise, uh, on the other hand, uh, there's many articles written that it's not um, something that you should base a reassessment off of. So uh, we need more clarity as to uh, what we should be using to, to trigger a reassessment. But I, I can say this from the numbers that I'm seeing right now, uh, it's a, uh, our values are so wrong uh, that it's, it's something that needs to be addressed um, where we have we have actual assessed values of 100,000 and these properties are being bought for half a million dollars. 
uh, this is putting an unfair burden on on the people, you know, especially the elderly that have lived in their homes for 50, 50 years. Uh, these people are paying more in taxes because of our failure to launch a reassessment. And I, I'm, I'm not a, a huge advocate of, of reassessment, but sitting where I sit, it, it is, it's heartbreaking to see the, the problems and, and the concerns our elderly have uh, with, with the increasing millage rates, and Williamsport's another good example of that. Uh, another increase of uh, what a half of a mill and and they they don't get those types of increases in their social security um, so we truly um, our state legislature needs to look at this it's that they've tried to come up with so many different ways of uh, assessing and making something fair uh, as far as taxation whether it's you know personal income tax or Sale, increasing the sales tax, and yet there's nothing that I see uh, that compares with the property tax. So it is a serious issue that not only like Cumming County is facing, but many counties in, in uh, the state of Pennsylvania face. And I still believe that we're still, uh, what is it? We're one of only six states that don't automatically launch a reassessment every four to six years uh, in the nation. So I hope they can come up with something soon. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, Brooke, but I think that we're on track to do a reassessment and that we're on the waiting list with Tyler. Right? We've purchased we have purchased software with the intent to go live with the software, but there has been no contract drawn up with Tyler to do a reassessment. I thought we had done, um, we'll have to ask Tom, I thought we had done some, some preliminary work that had us on their waiting list. No, we are not on no. their waiting list. We have had discussions with Tyler about reassessments, but there has been no contract drawn up to do a reassessment. Okay. All right. Well, we'll have to look into that. Any other comments? Hearing none, can I have a motion to accept the agreement? So I'll move to approve. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 So carried. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you. 4.4 4 is with Mark Davison voting on. 2021 County Certification of Ag Preservation Funding. Mark, are you on the line? I am. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning. Okay. Good morning. Um, this, this request is for approval for our certification of county funds for the Ag Preservation Program for 2021. Uh, this action is something that we're required to provide to Harrisburg each year. Um, they use these funds and plug them into their allocation formula and arrive at a total uh, 2021 allocation for our easement program. Uh, we would find out our allocations at the end of February following the state board meeting in Harrisburg. Um, the, the county funds are, <coughs> excuse me, are made up of uh, two pieces. $50,000 that's included in the 2021 county budget. And then you'll see on the form uh, a figure of $4,608. And that is clean and green rollback tax penalties collected in 2020. Uh, if there's an ag preservation program in the county, those funds are required by law to be provided for the program. Um, I guess. Typically, we receive probably five to six to one. Uh, we would expect two hundred fifty to three hundred thousand uh, dollars for a total allocation. So it's it's usually a annually a, a really good investment. Um, so I guess if if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. 
Do you you don't typically go down to that meeting, right? There's no need for anyone to be at the meeting. No, no. I think it's pretty standard procedure. They have a formula. They plug it into uh, and arrive at the allocations. That's why they're pretty consistent year in and year out. Okay, any other questions? Hearing none, can I have a motion to accept the county certification of the Ag Preservation Funding? I'll move to approve. Second. All fair side? Aye. Aye. Aye, so carried. Thank you, Commissioners. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Mark. 4.5, Catherine Nichols, vote on agreement with Steel Fusion Clinical Toxicology Laboratories. Morning. Good morning. Um, so on behalf of the coroner's office, we are requesting approval for two of our contracts. The first one being with Steel Fusion Clinical Toxicology Laboratory um, in the amount of $350 per case. Okay, any questions or comments? Where are they located out of? Um, Manesson, PA. How, how far is that? In several hours. <laughs> And when when you uh, when you take someone there, uh, is it just one or two people? This is not for autopsy. Okay. So this is for our buckle swabs that we use typically in suspected opioid cases. What we do is it's just um, swabbing the person's mouth, um, and then we can have a turnaround time. Usually 48 hours, we have results back, so we can um, figure out whether we need to autopsy that person then or if we can certify the death certificate and release that individual for further disposition. So this has saved us significantly over the past couple years. It's a uh, new testing that's available. Um, it, and I know I think two years ago alone I had figured out we saved over forty thousand dollars and what we would have spent on autopsying these people had we have not had this resource. How often do you, you do the test? Um, typically last year we had between 30 and 40 drug deaths, so I would say we're doing probably about that a year. And that just, it varies based on the drug cases that we deal with. Okay, any questions? Can I have a motion to accept the agreement? With Steel Fusion Clinical Toxicology Lab. I move to approve. I'll second. All favor say aye. 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 So carried. And then Catherine has um, forensic five four point six forensic pathology associates. Okay, so Commissioner Macera, this would be um, forensic pathology associates is who we do our autopsies. Um, what? and they do have a price listing right now. I would say from seeing bills, we're anywhere between roughly two to $5,000. Um, we get closer to 5,000 if we're doing a child or an infant. Okay, any questions on that? So just a quick question. So um, if, if a member of the community wanted an autopsy on a would they pay for that? Uh, yes. Typic it depends on the circumstance. Um, for us, it's always case by case basis. If they have some, they think their style play involves something criminal, we're going to autopsy them. Um, but if it's something more clinical and the family's looking for a civil suit, whether they have an issue with malpractice or something like that, um, typically that will go private autopsy and then they can shoot they don't even have to use forensic pathology associates they're welcome to look for any pathologist okay thank you you're welcome okay Motion to oh, one last question yeah, so sure. who makes if I if I say hey you know what I think there was foul play here who makes the call on whether this there was foul play is that the DA or is that the coroner you know, in terms of paying for the uh, for, for the uh, autopsy, uh, typically it's the coroner's office that pays the autopsy fee. If uh, criminal charges are filed, the district attorney's office can take um, the autopsy fees and then add that towards restitution. Okay, thanks. Sure. 
I have motion to accept the forensic pathology associates agreement. So moved. I move. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 So carried. Thank you. Thank you. 4.7, Shannon Rossman, vote on rejecting the solo proposal for Wintersport Region Relief Well and Rehabilitation Project. Where's Shannon? Good morning, Commissioners. Um, as you know, we had a RFP out for the relief wells uh, around the Williamsport and South Williamsport uh, area levy. Um, unfortunately, we do have a RACP grant for this, but they require the use of U.S. Steel. Um, and U.S. Steel in the last six months has kind of skyrocketed. Um, it was up over 1058 metric ton, and... Um, the bid came in about a million dollars more than we thought it was going to come in because of the requirement to use U.S. Steel with the RACP grant. We consulted with Delta, who is helping us with the RACP grant, and uh, we do have time. Um, it's a five-year grant, so we're not, we're in the beginning part of the grant, the first year, so we do have time that uh, if we want to reevaluate uh, a few times this year, just determine when the best time to rebid would be, um, with the hopes that U.S. Steel would come down. That's why we're we're making the recommendation to reevaluate and reject the the bid. The bid was good. There was nothing wrong with it, other than the fact that, unfortunately, due to the cost of steel. And whether it's a cost of steel increasing the the, uh, the bid. Or whether, which we would question, mm -hmm. you know, why are we using American Steel? Well, I, I'd like to use American Steel for sure, but uh, I also have to run a county and, and be held accountable to the, the uh, taxpayers. Yeah. And that put a, uh, a large, a large uh, problem with the, right. the funding. Right. Um, so whether it's materials, that uh, we use, or whether it's labor, the taxpayers, and someday we have to come to an agreement that governments should be able to get a job done at a lower rate or a competitive rate. And um, this is just another example of how we did not foresee the extra cost. And what was what was the uh, relief wells? Was that in the five million dollar range? No. Um, or one, what uh, was that? The bid came in at about 3.7 million. We were expecting around, um, do, now we have some additional environmental costs because some of the relief wells are in the area where the Avco plume is. So we'll have to do a little bit of extra testing and things like that. But we were expecting around two three to two seven, and it came in at three seven. And our rack P grant is only a million dollars, so basically we're paying the steel. Yeah, I mean there there was a few other costs in there, like the, to have having to address COVID. We're required to address COVID during this time frame and things like that. So that did add to the cost too. Um, we don't think the cost would have been 3.7. We do think it would have been a little less than that because they were cautious and they gave us a cost per well for the environmental testing and, and, and getting rid of some of those, those, the fluids and the silt coming out of those wells. Um, so we would, of course, only have to pay for the ones that they had to um, actually dispose of materials appropriately. Um, but it's still, the cost of the, the U.S. steel was still the, the the deciding factor. Um, now, we think that RACP might be opening up again in the fall, so if we were to rebid, maybe we could see about trying to get some additional funds if it's still higher than expected. Um, so that is potentially an opportunity. I mean, we have to we have to get the project done sometime in the next couple of years, and we do have to make sure that we're doing it through a full season, because some of the wells need to be done in the winter time, just based upon where they're located at. You need firmer ground. Some wells can be done during the summertime. 
you know, we're going to have some additional costs just because when um, PennDOT put some of their ramps in, um, they went over some of the areas of the levees, then it kind of cut off access. So we have to put some, some of our own access ramps in, especially around the Faxon area. And there's a couple of relief wells that if they're not, what they'll be doing is they'll rehab a well, which is basically going in and pressure testing, getting rid of anything that's in there, doing any minor, minor things to it. And as long as it passes, then we're good. If it has to be replaced, there's a few wells in certain areas you just can't replace. So we'll have to work with Army Corps then to see if they're needed and we can replace them somewhere else or if we will have to, uh, or if we're able to abandon them. So, but at this point in time, we thought since we do have time that it would be beneficial to us to wait and hope things settle down. Okay, any other questions or comments? I have a motion to reject the solo proposal for Williamsburg Region Relief Well Rehabilitation Project. I move to reject. I second. All in favor say aye. 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 So carried. And, and just to clarify, because of the rejection, you, you don't feel that there's any, any possibility of us getting decertified for the amount of time it may take to, to revisit? I don't think so. We have to move forward and we have to, um, some of the things that have to happen with the, the Williamsburg area levy right now is putting together the operational strategy, which is basically doing a very large oversight of the levy and identifying individual projects, doing somewhat of a cost estimate on some of those projects and saying, okay, Williamsport, South Williamsport, you need to make sure that you have X amount of money in your budgets for the future. Um, and that's one of the reasons why the Army Corps, the Army Corps has that requirement for this July. Um, and then their SWIFT report has to be updated every year. Um, and that will also come into play this July. Um, and uh, we were very lucky to uh, be included in the word of the the Ward Act is a federal act that talks about water, water resource. Oh, yeah. I, I can't quite remember what it is, but it's basically going to, what it's getting us is the Army Corps is going to do its own analysis of the, the Williamsport area levy system and make a determination of those projects also. And they will do that themselves. They will come in, they will look at everything. And from there, then they'll start identifying um, and we'll start pushing for funding for those projects. So it's kind of all starting to come together. It's just that this the steel is is what kind of is holding us back right now. We we will be hopefully within the next week or two coming back to you with the recommendation for the consultant for the Memorial Avenue design project. So it's not that we're not moving forward. We are still looking for funding for some of the for the cross pipes. Um, for Williamsport and South Williamsport because um, we didn't get the H2O funding and that was not, that program was not funded for this year. So we're still looking for him for funding. We're still moving those projects forward. Um, we're just doing the ones that we have funding for currently. And we're utilizing county staff to, to find them as well as a consultant. Yeah, yeah. We have um, we have Keller Associates who, who works at the, f the federal level and state level sometimes, but they were very key to getting us in the WERDA, which took a few years. I think that was two or three years to get us actually into the WERDA Act and make sure that we were, they also helped us get the um, EDA grant from Memorial Avenue and they'll help us reapply for the for another EDA grant in the future for Dewey Avenue. And, and the importance of the word up is, is to, to be placed on the, the authorization. If you're not placed on the authorization, then there's no chance of us getting money. So that was big news. Yes, it's, and it's key. I mean, we still have to push for the funding of those projects, for funding of all the implementation of it, but just getting on that act is half the battle. Um, the other half and now will be to see what the Army Corps comes up with and hopefully it kind of corresponds with what we're already doing, but then they'll, they'll start pushing for funding. 
So it's not guaranteed funding, but it's it's the next best thing. So, so I mean, I, you know, I hate to keep pounding this subject, but so we spend a lot of money in consultation fees and doing design and you know putting together a bid, mm -hmm. something that we can say this is about what it's going to cost us. Now the Army Corps comes in and does their own analysis? They take what is already out there and then anything that they need to add to, they'll they, add to. They take our information? Well, they'll take whatever information is currently available. Okay. And then they'll also add in whatever additional information. If there were no, no information available to them, what would happen? I don't know. Okay. I'm just I, saying. Yeah, I don't know. If if we're going to I don't think we'd be on the Word Act if there was no information available. Okay. I, I think having the information that we have has what is what help has helped us to and helped Keller Associates to get us on the Word Act because of the fact that, you know, we have a levy system and it is the only thing protecting a good majority of our of our real estate. Okay. So I mean, and the fact that we do have um, a large majority of our industrial park and everything is being protected by the levy, I think that's helped us also. Okay. And it seems like people are still interested in being there, so making sure that they have, you know, while it might cost uh, us some money to do the projects to upgrade it, I mean, you're, you know, I know that when we were looking at ShopVac previously, and I can't remember what they're called now, but, um, it was significant amount of money. I mean, they were they were looking at, I think the that was three hundred thousand dollars a year. There's nobody that's going to be able to afford that kind of insurance. Okay, thanks for the work. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Shannon. You you stick stick by for the next. Sure. Okay. Commissioner, comment. I'd like to revisit the uh, the golf course first of all. Um, in the past year, we, we've explored selling land around the golf course, not the course itself, the two courses, but land around it. Uh, we've been um, blocked by a, uh, a agreement in the past with federal monies that went to um, some structures over there. It's an agreement from September of 1978 that involved uh, $20,000 that prohibits us from doing so. So we have to do a, a land swap in order to uh, to make this work. Um, this happened to the city of Reading. Uh, they put up a $10 million building and then found out later that uh, they were in the same situation where the land was tied to federal monies. They had to go out and purchase extra land because they didn't have any to swap at the time. Uh, so uh, we're still working on this. Uh, even though we're making uh, enhancements and improvements to the golf course, we're still working on this. And uh, I asked Shannon to stay if you just elaborate how Keller and Associates are, are helping us and uh, and we have something in the works possibly uh, without going into detail uh, about how we may be able to do some kind of a land swap in the future. Yeah, um, we asked Keller to look into how the land swap works and if there was any way around it. Um, basically Tom was able to say there really isn't any way around it unless you have a congressional, unless you, you have an act done at the congressional level. Um, what he is going to help us with and what we think will be able to be very useful is he's going to help us through the process to make sure that we can do it as quickly as possible within the realm of the process. He's already talked to uh, both the federal and the state level. Um, there is a checklist. Um, he's putting that together right now for us. Um, we need to provide him with a, which our office is working on, a general map of what we think we might be able to swap. Um, the only issue right now is one, you can't own the property already, which what we're hoping to do will, will be beneficial with that because we're not in a, a rush and the people aren't in a rush to sell. Um, the other issue is, is that it's, it's not necessarily an acre for acre, it's a value for value. Um, so uh, that's a little hard to to, to determine without having without moving forward. But once we kind of get a a sense that the state and feds might be interested in what we're proposing, then we could move forward and and then spend the money for the yellow book appraisal that we need. Um, we don't want to do that until we're sure that we're at least they're at least interested in what we're proposing. 
and one of the other issues that and why initially when we were looking at this is they were saying it takes five to seven years to do was because there's one person at the federal level one person and the federal level who approves these one <laughs> that's it so it's obviously not his top priority so which is why it will be helpful to have Keller doing a lot of the pressure and and reach out and everything so okay so we continue to work on it so, yep so it's a goal in the future mm -hmm. we haven't forgot it yeah and and since the way that we have structured it you know we have our plans and waiting I mean, we can even phase it possibly depending upon how that works so so it I think we're in a good position now we just need to to kind of get a a little nod that says yes we're, we're we like what you're doing and then we can look at moving forward but what's so very frustrating at least from our positions is that here if we if we would have known mm -hmm. that there was a restriction placed for a, a very minimal amount of money that we received okay and this is what's so upsetting. I, you know, there were agencies that were created for the betterment of our people. I, I get it, and to maintain the environment and have recreation for the people, and you, know, you borrow money, da 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 da. But the strings that are attached in some of these cases, especially with the golf course, okay, there was, there was a project over there that was not very successful, okay, and it only probably encompassed maybe three acres at the most okay uh, I'll just say it bluntly they held 450 acres hostage okay and we're the taxpayers we are the people and when agencies have that power to stop us from doing the common good I'm representing the taxpayers and trying to save them money and try to diversify and try to get rid of property that, that not, is not necessary and why government has it in the first place, okay? These are something that we have to pay attention to and we have to get our legislature to change those rules and, and, and plead with these agencies, you know? It's very bad when, when agencies usurp the power of the air elected officials and most of them do. And, and sometimes it's self-imposed because we elected officials don't want to take the responsibility on ourselves. Commissioner Marabito says it most of the times and he's, I, we sometimes disagree but we wholeheartedly agree on this. Hold your elected officials accountable for what they do. Don't place it in the hands of agencies who they're not accountable to anybody. Right. So, you know, this land swap is another good example of, we looked at the Sylvandell project, which was how many acres? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head, but it was, it, if we would have known in advance, this would have been perfect. It would have been perfect. Yeah. And way above what we needed. Yes. And, and I think they should take that into consideration. The, the heck, we should be able to go back on the projects that we looked at creating for recreation and environmental issues you know and I mean I'm sorry I, I'm yeah. I'm upset I and I think everyone agree. should be upset yeah about this yeah yeah and unfortunately it would take an act of Congress to do that yeah well it I should mean, happen though I mean there should if you yeah unfortunately this didn't show up on the deeds and because it happened so long ago and so many reiterations ago of the authority because initially it was the Williamsport Rec Authority I think or Williamsport like coming Rec Authority so we learned this in February of yeah. last year 2020 yeah yeah so and, and, a couple yeah. things um, by the way we should ask Congressman Keller to put together a bill and see if we can not get it moved um, but with Tom Keller um, and I, I like Tom Kelly, he's been very helpful on the levy. I think we just have to be cognizant of where, how we're paying him on this because if this is around for seven years, there's no point spending a fortune with a lobbyist um, where, where we can also get the congressman's office to sort of monitor the checklist for us. That's just a, 
sort of like let's not spend more money on something that is going to be around for a long time. Um, so I don't know how he's billing us on it. And this is I falling think, under I our current us run contract. Seven years worth of consulting fees to basically, you know, just keep track of something. This is falling under our current contract, um, and uh, where we pay him a set fee per month, and he works on various projects as directed. And commission on the retainer. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And commissioner, if we're able to swap the land with the with the entity that we're talking about, that would not take nearly that length of time. Right. Right. I think that I thought there was something in the legislation about you can't swap it if there's other federal or state money involved. We have to we reach were out. We to purchase yes. Sylvandale because we got money from the from the state, which came, I think, partly from the feds. So I, I don't know. I'm not but sure. Anyway, about just I, if, if you, I leave that to your discretion, Shannon. If you if you feel comfortable that we're not running up a huge bill, it's on the retainer and so forth. I just hate to have have throw good money after bad, as the expression goes. You know. Yeah, I'm not sure about the um, funding situation. I, I I can't remember if you're allowed to use use do that. However, um, we do have to look at the property that we're we're looking at and make sure that there are it meets the criteria. So we will have to contact right. that entity and get a background on the property. There are some things that are not allowed, so we will have to look at that. Okay. Okay, thank you, Shan. Mm -hmm. Uh, the next thing is we have a opening. We actually have two openings on our boards, uh, the Board of Assessment Appeals. We have an opening. If anyone would be interested in volunteering, uh, please uh, look at our website. You can fill out an application and, and uh, submit it. And also we have an opening on our Planning Commission. If you're interested in, in applying for the Planning Commission, please uh, fill out a form and submit it to the Commissioner's Office. And we thank all our boards for their, their time and efforts. Um, for uh, volunteering for those very important boards. And the last thing, I just want to give you an update on the uh, task force that we've developed in the county for the vaccines. Uh, we were on a call last Thursday of about 35 other individuals that were state elected officials, uh, representatives from both uh, hospitals, guys that are UPMC. Um, most every uh, superintendent in, this, in the school districts uh, throughout Lycoming County and we discussed uh, the vaccines and what was going on. What we did learn is uh, obviously what we've heard in the public is uh, there's not enough uh, supply for the demand, um, which is interesting because the federal government is making a million vaccines per day. Um, President Biden would like to increase that to 1.5 million per day, but right now it's 1, point, or it's 1 million per day. However, Pennsylvania is only getting 140,000 per week and that's going across the state. Uh, Philadelphia County is allowed to do their own plan, but the other counties in Pennsylvania are not allowed to do their own plan, uh, which is frustrating. Uh, Department of Health has taken the lead on this and uh, has uh, failed to disperse the information down to the counties. They're going to take $100 million of federal monies that were given to them in the COVID relief bill and provide a communication plan to the counties. Um, we know that the, all emergencies start at the local levels. Our EMAs throughout the counties can do this job efficiently and effectively with the hospitals that, that have, uh, um, they have in their communities. However, uh, the DOH is, is, uh, is taking their time on this. If you take 140,000 vaccines, it takes 52 weeks to get to 7.2 million. And uh, that's their target of the population of Pennsylvania. We can't wait a year for vaccines across the state of Pennsylvania. Florida is doing this effectively. West Virginia is doing this effectively. There are states that are doing it effectively. Effectively, yeah, Pennsylvania uh, seems to be behind the eight ball on this. So uh, we continue to ask for, for uh, answers and look to see what's truly going on behind the scenes. Uh, they tell us to be patient. Everybody's asked to be patient. Uh, I think we've been patient long enough. We need to cry out to our legislators in, in Harrisburg and uh, Congressman Keller to get to the bottom of this. Why aren't vaccines being delivered to Pennsylvania? Um, another frustrating part was Operation Warp Speed was the prior administration's um, vaccine plan for 
distributing the vaccines. A million of them are going out. Uh, there was to go out through FedEx, uh, UPS, uh, the local sheriffs across the, the uh, country were on a conference call with the, the uh, Department of Defense back on December 2nd. It was all ready to go and ready to roll out. However, at the local levels, they don't seem to know what Operation Warp Speed is. They have uh, no knowledge of it because it hasn't been sent down from the state level. And they're kind of in the dark about what Operation Warp Speed truly is, yet we've heard about it on the news. We heard, we heard how it was going to be explained, yet um, our local health officials don't have any guidance on it. So again, we need to reach out and get the vaccines, get answers and get these out to the people. Right now, if you call the local numbers that you can't get vaccines, I encourage anyone to go out and get a vaccine if they want to. Uh, please don't wait. We want to get our seniors taken care of and our first line uh, medical people taken care of, people that are, are at risk every day. Uh, it'd be great to have our teachers vaccinated right in the schools. There's school nurses that can do it at every, every school. They could have those done in a day so we could have our schools in, in, in session. They wouldn't have to be worrying about whether they reach a certain level and then shut down school again, which is greatly affecting our kids. There's many ways we can get this done. It's just getting the guidance from the state to do so. So uh, please make phone calls. If you, can get a, if you can get a vaccine, please do so. Right now, uh, the average person I hear is taking anywhere from an hour to two hours on the phone of waiting. And uh, some people are getting in because of cancellations right away. Other people are booked out for six to eight weeks. And uh, so good luck in, in trying to get a vaccine. And we encourage you, please reach out to our state legislators, flood their phones, uh, and let them know that they need to get answers from the DOH on moving, how this is going to move forward. And that's what I have for today. Um, I have two, two issues here. Mm -hmm. um, I read the article in the paper today regarding the election process. Forrest uh -huh. was there. And he was quoted. And uh, there, he, he made a statement about... Um, you know, this is going to be an off-year election, and you know things won't be as hectic. And you know, uh, I've mentioned this on several meetings. It never gets reported. Uh, I mentioned it the the Tuesday before the, and I won't call it insurrection, okay? But the demonstration on the Capitol. And um, you wonder why people are upset. You wonder how they look at themselves as patriots or insurgents. And I, I don't know, insurrectionists. I don't know, but I can tell you this, it can't wait. This can't wait for the next election. Not, I'm, this coming year, this primary, there should be bills in the Pennsylvania House to, to and across this nation that address the problems that we're having, or this will just be the start of what's about to come. There are, uh, one every four years, you have a national election for the presidency of the United States. And it's a big deal. And why don't they care about voter ID at the boxes? Why will they allow unsecured drop boxes that can be stuffed? Okay, they keep saying there's no proof, but we're telling you, you can't catch the proof if you don't secure the ballots, if you don't secure the votes. If, and this is a major problem. When, when you have same day registrations in states, there is no possible way that you can tell if those votes should be counted because that they just registered. So we have major problems in this country. And when they say it's a state's, you know, right, sovereignty, well, I'm going to argue that right now from what I see. Every four years there's a national election. And unless we take, the federal government takes charge of the national election, this country is in trouble. 
they do have consequences. When you start to listen to what's going on in executive orders, and I don't care which president it is, and when you start to hear about them taking away the filibusters, it's a protection for the people, okay? When you talk about retribution, the Italians were hung in this country only second to the black people, and they want to give them money? Give it to me as well. Give it to everybody. What the hell is going on here that they think that they can wait another four years? This is ridiculous, okay? And, and you're hearing about the Electoral College being challenged. Well, if you don't protect your drop boxes, if they're not secure, you don't ask for voters' ID, then California and New York will rule this nation. And I don't believe anyone, anyone, whether you're a Democrat, Republican, or even a communist would agree to this. So, please, call your state reg legislators, call your federal legislators. We need to address this before this problem gets even bigger. And then, on a more bright note, Noah's Earth Day cleanup. He's an eight-year-old boy. I don't know if you can see him. He's just... He's, he's a good-looking boy. Uh, Mom and Dad should be very proud of him. He wants Noah's Earth Day cleanup for Williamsport, and he needs our help. So we need some bags and some uh, things that uh, uh, to organize this this cleaning up litter. He hates litter uh, in the city of Williamsport, and I know I'm going to get on board, and I'm going to ask some of my colleagues and other people. Uh, that can help for his cause to uh, clean up Williamsport on Earth Day. I think it was uh, on top there. Yeah, April seventeenth. Yeah, that's awesome. So, so join in uh, Noah's day and and let's help Noah get something accomplished. Okay, great. Thank you, Commissioner Miravito. Yeah, I just want to comment on the. Uh, on the vaccine here. I think it's, you know, the Sun Gazette had an editorial Sunday about patients, and I think Commissioner Metzger mentioned this. It's, I think the most important thing all of us can do is to try to help manage the expectations of the public, because the public is under an expectation that they're going to be able to get the vaccine tomorrow. And the reality is that there just is not enough vaccine produced for a country with you know, 315 million people. And then don't forget, we are buying from the same companies that are selling vaccines all around the world, right? I mean, the UK, Europe, all these countries, it's a worldwide pandemic. So if we can continue to try to take care of the most vulnerable, make sure that we're getting people with pre-existing conditions, people who are seniors, getting them vaccinated, and then at the same time being responsible in terms of not going and gathering places where we don't have to gather, uh, not, you know, washing our hands, wearing masks, doing all the things that we can do until we get it. I fully expect that many people won't get the vaccine till June, July, August, because there's just not enough to do. We definitely need to uh, obviously push our state legislators, as Commissioner Metzger was saying. And, but, but I think all of us, well, there was some agreement on the task force phone call. Uh, I think, I, I can't remember whether Steve Johnson or not, but certainly Senator Yaw pointed out that he wasn't sure it was going to be helpful to do more distribution centers because there's no vaccine to put in those centers. So, you know, we could, like, we had gotten some uh, I've gotten some emails from some people saying, you know, why, why don't you open up more vaccination centers? Well, if there's no vaccine, then what it does is it simply raises people's expectations about being able to get it. Um, I think that, you know, everything is being done. Look, everyone at the federal and state and local government, we all want to keep people safe and get them vaccinated as quickly as possible, right? It isn't as though at some level of government people are trying not to. but. I think it's important for us to think, to know that we have to continue to just do the responsible things, manage expectations, try to be patient, and, and try to fight also to make sure our rural communities are not left behind. Um, 
so so that's all that's all i want to say on that on the vaccine that we're not out of the woods yet and the, the best thing people can do is to try to not uh engage in battering right i mean that's where that's where these outbreaks where it, it trips from one person to another okay. and yes commissioner Masser, i had my flyer here from noah and uh, uh, I was planning to to uh, pitch in either with a T-shirt or some way, but he, he is a very incredible young boy that takes that task on, and we certainly will help him. And my question is then, too, with a state that has a large senior population, and they're making a million dosages a day, why is Pennsylvania only getting 140,000 vaccines? per week that's my question to be answered and I hope they can come up with an answer because more than one person's asking it and I, I talked to, to mr. Johnson yesterday and uh, he said that there are plans in the works once the vaccines arrive uh, to mobilize and and send out to homes uh, I we've had a number of calls from seniors mm -hmm. who no longer drive and uh, are actually afraid to go out, uh, but uh, uh, they wanted to know if anybody could come to them and give them shots. And, uh, and I called him up and he said, yes, they are making plans on mo having mobile units to go out to different facilities to administer the vaccine. That's good news. Yeah, and certainly, you know, at the point where we see more vaccines coming, if we need more distribution centers, we certainly could do that and uh, you know get it out there we'll see the the uh, you know I, I just did a little math and I think it's it, at that rate it's about 606,000 a month at the 140,000 a week did you say 140,000 what you say it's 140,000 yeah. a week that's going to cross the state of Pennsylvania yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Take, it'll take 52 going. weeks to get to the 7.2 million that they want to target right right that's why that's why uh well hopefully we can purchase more and, and get more into production okay public comment this time mm -hmm. okay um mc green uh, first of all she'd like the contact information for noah's cleanup project is there anything on there where they can contact uh, him or? no I'm, i'll be calling them today okay and i'll get more information for next week Okay, and she also wanted to say thank you for the um, details on the uh, golf carts, the financial details. Okay. And her last question is, um, she said her last word about the golf course discussion was appreciated. Is there a path on the course where motorized chairs for disabled can be used? Maybe you should read the, the full first comment. Read all the comments. Where is it? My computer's like frozen here. Do you want to read them, Ed? Yeah. Okay. okay. This is stuck, sorry. It's okay. No worries. Um, going in order from the beginning for live chat comments. MC Green, thank you for the detailed explanation. Mac, can you speak into the mic a little bit better? Thank you. So the, the first live chat comment was uh, from MC Green. Thank you for the detailed explanation of the financing of the golf carts and the importance of a public golf course during the pandemic. This level of detail is extraordinary and, and that's where she later on says, my last word about the golf course discussion was appreciated. Is there a path on the course where motorized chairs for the disabled can be used? So, Matt, or MC Green, the, the problem, I mean, if they're playing golf, there is. If they're not playing golf, the, the, the problem with having folks on the course, because I've asked this about having people jog, the problem is people getting hit by a golf ball. And so, if they're not golfing, they, they really can't be on the court. Isn't that correct, Matt? The yes, Commissioner, but um, you know, we're continually uh, 
working with Indigo to try to identify alternate, uh, you know, sources or, or uh, types of recreation out right. there. Right. It's just channeling. And hopefully, in that some, some ways we can use those those beautiful paths and so forth for people who aren't golfing. Okay. Uh, next comment was from John Shireman. The sign at the entrance clearly states mass required. Uh, a little bit further on, he clarifies and said, I see there are two people sitting at the commissioner's desk not wearing masks. Why? Uh, comment from, hopefully I don't mess this up, uh, Tahira Vizriel. There is where is the minority representation? Another comment from her: Nothing really happening, or nothing really helping the disadvantaged in the community. Um, comment from Misty Dion: Minority and marginalized representation is key. Nothing about us without us. I see you, Tahira, lead on sister. Comment from Bill Fenderson. We do not stand, where do we stand on the airport? Are we going to get another uh, airline in the area or not? And then MC Green, can we have a contact for NOAA's cleanup project? Okay. Uh, we did meet with the airport authority and uh, Commissioner Massari, you want to take that? Okay. Um, we are actively looking, well, they're actively looking for another airline. Um, their, their hands were tied. They had to take American Airlines back uh, until March um, due to funding. Uh, they would lose their funding, their federal funding, if they didn't do so. Um, so they had to take them back. Uh, we all know that the American Airlines relationship has, has been strained. It's not been a good one. Uh, basically, um, they came back because they needed their COVID monies, and uh, so they had to come back. Um, the Charlotte um, terminal has been given to Wilkesbury, so they're doing the one between here and Philadelphia. Um, but the airport authority is in, in talks with other airlines, and uh, we made it very clear we will not be giving them any money if it continue with American Airlines. We made that very clear to them. We want a new partner, uh, whether it be one, two, three, more airlines, and they are actively researching and, and doing their homework on that. Um, so they're in negotiations right now with, with other airlines. I, I will say that uh, I've gotten a couple calls from uh, constituents out there, and they think it's absurd that they're seeing advertising mm -hmm. for the Williamsport Airport, like coming airport. And I have to agree with them. Absolutely. I mean, uh, the first 10 days they had uh, 30 people flying on those planes. That averaged to, to less than three a day. Okay. They, they've they given us a one o'clock uh, fly out. Who's going to travel there? Why, uh, you know, unless, you know, we, we talked to them. You know, why would you be spending your money in advertising right now uh, unless it's a requirement? You know, I, a lot of people have the same questions for commissioners, and unless you're sitting in our shoes, you, you, it's hard to understand why we do some of the things that we do. And I guess I'm not standing in their shoes, so I, I, I don't know, but I, I will go back and question them for the constituents that have complained about it because it certainly doesn't make sense to me either. Yeah. So if I can just jump in and I just, I hope the public understands, you know, the people on the airport authority are volunteers like all of our board. They, they're not getting paid. They're doing, you know, everything I think they can to try to meander through a difficult situation. Um, and I think that part of the reason, I don't want to speak for them, but part of the reason they may be doing the advertising is it takes a certain amount of impression to even get back into people's consciousness about the fact that 
that uh, you know there is an airport there, and they've been advertising a lot of the free parking. So um, I think they're probably doing it in anticipation of being able to get this problem situation resolved. Uh, but I don't want to speak for them, and I'm I'm sure Commissioner Mathieu will will ask them about it. But I just hope the public understands that you know it's not that they're not trying. They, when, when, when they wanted to get rid of America, the federal government said, hey, you, you take it back or you lose some of your money. So it, it's complicated, but it's certainly, uh, I think everyone's on the same page about wanting to get service that isn't at one in the afternoon to Philadelphia and so forth. And I don't want to say, I don't want to say, we have to, obviously we'll continue to be advocates, uh, but I, I just want people to understand that the airport authority members you know, as individuals, are all people who are committed to trying to to do what they uh, think is best to try to get a good air, air uh, okay. service back here. And they're just upset, as upset as we are uh, with American Airlines as well. The the you know uh, the general consensus is that they're going to leave after March. Mm -hmm. So you have no money. So putting in color half-page ads in the paper makes no sense um, we're having until you're ready to be a great until you know we have a good partner and we're a good airlines in our airport uh, yeah how do you how do you advertise no no plates coming out of an airport we're having electronics uh, electronic billboard over top of Starbucks that's not cheap <laughs> I, I I'll I'll ask them I'm sure there's yeah. a a legitimate response. But at the same time, they are doing their best. Um, they met, they had an emergency meeting on Christmas Eve when they found this out, and um, their their uh, their hands are tied to take them back. Um, they are looking for our other airlines, and they're they're working on that. So hopefully, they'll have success in the near future. You know, it's, it's pretty ironic. The American only came back because they were going to lose their COVID money, yeah. and we only took them back because. We were going to lose our money, so it's kind of like yeah. a, a divorce that's, uh, you know, and not that's, going, yeah. going and well that's financially. Why, and that's a decision yeah. made by government. It's a divorce. <laughs> you live in one side of the house, I'll live in the other side of the house until the house is sold. Exactly. Yep. Okay, any other comments? Mr. Stout. Yes, Larry Stout um, from Montgomery. Just uh, one of the other, uh, in relation to the COVID vaccine, uh, just an observation and, and maybe a concern is that um, already, I think it was British Airways is requiring you to have a, a vaccine to travel to, to Britain. Uh, the Buffalo Bills and their playoff game required people to have, uh, you know, a card showing you had a vaccine to get into the game. If this catches on, What's to keep Rainbow Carpets from saying, "Hey, you don't come in unless you get unless you you'll get carded at the door, so to speak"? And I'm I'm concerned that if this this becomes sort of the norm, that I can't go to a high school football game unless I have my card, and it's being delayed by government, you're 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 screwed. I mean, forgive me, but you're really it's a so either in my I think it's okay to do that once a year goes by and it you know everybody's had a chance but i think it's going to we want to get commerce up and running and this actually could be a deterrent if that concept kept, catches on for good reasons quote unquote uh so i don't know in the midst of our you know pushing for the the vaccine could could maybe also kind of acknowledge that we can't go overboard on the protection side until everyone has a chance to get the vaccine Larry, I will assure you, you will always be welcome into my business whether you have a vaccine. Thank you. Uh, that's comforting thought. Thank you. It, it's, it's very true, Mr. Stout, because they've talked about this, these cards and whether you'll be able to actually go anywhere without mm -hmm. the card. Mm -hmm. It's like another passport, mm -hmm. form of a full passport, which is ironic because you need a photo ID to do everything in life, but you, you don't need one to vote. Yeah. You don't need that photo ID to vote. So yeah. it, it's convenient when government wants it. You know, just thought of them. I wouldn't have mentioned yep. it. Thank you. Okay, any public comment this time? Mm -hmm. Okay, hearing none, we are 
will be adjourned. Our next meeting, we've completed our agenda. There will be no meeting Thursday. So our next meeting will be on uh, Tuesday, February 2nd at 10 a.m. And we'll see if the Groundhog saw a shadow that morning when we adjourn. Thank you. Have a great day.